Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining all of us today for ISB's Research Roundtable. This is a new series that we're starting to keep you up to date on our research. Our intention is to have one of these just about every month through the end of the year, so keep an eye out for our emails. Today we'll be hearing from our featured scientist, and then there will be an opportunity for questions and answers after that. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and you're welcome to submit questions at any time. I'll be monitoring those, and when Sean is done with his presentation, we'll move to the question and answer session, and we'll work through those questions. Now I'd like to introduce another member of the ISB family, Barb Moe. Barb serves on ISB's foundation board, which helps ISB raise philanthropic contributions. Barb has been a volunteer and supporter of ISB for 10 years, along with her husband, Chris. She graduated from UW and she enjoyed a long career as a graphic designer running her own small company. She then segued into collaborating with an interior designer working on multifamily new developments. Barb is also a member of the City of Medina Parks and Recreation Board. And we're so happy to have her here today. Welcome, Barb. Thanks, Renee. I'm so happy to be here. As Renee mentioned, I'm wrapping up my first year as a foundation board member, but I've been a supporter of ISB for years. I was lucky enough to meet Sean at ISB's first Reimagine event in 2019 and have been fascinated by his research ever since. It is my pleasure to introduce Sean Gibbons today. Sean is an assistant professor here at ISB and the Washington Research Foundation Distinguished Investigator. Likelihood, he was born and raised in Montana and went to the University of Montana for his undergraduate studies. Sean has three bachelor's degrees, microbiology, molecular biology, and French literature. He was awarded a Fulbright scholarship to study at Uppsala University in Sweden, where he earned a master's degree in synthetic biology. Sean finished his PhD in biophysics at the University of Chicago in 2015. He started his faculty position at ISB in June of 2018, and here we are. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Barb. And thanks, Renee, and, and thanks to the development team and the, and the board for putting these events together uh, that allow us researchers to, to share our science with the broader ISB community. Let's see if I can share my screen. All right, somebody tell me if that doesn't look okay, otherwise I'll keep going. All right. So it's my great pleasure today to, to talk to you about the microbiome and some of the, the research that's been going on in our lab over the past couple of years. Um, I do mention personalized nutrition here, and, and I'll, I'll get to that, although you may feel like it was an April Fool's joke to, to have that as the title for the first few slides, so it'll take me a little while to get there. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction to the microbiome for those of you who, who may or may not be familiar with it. Um, I think, you know, broadly speaking, it's sort of shifted a bit philosophically how we think about our bodies. Uh, the microbiome is essentially a, all the microorganisms that call our bodies home. And not pathogens, not bad guys, uh, commensal organisms or organisms that live sort of in harmony with, with our bodies. Um, and in that sense, you can kind of think of the whole human endeavor here as, as a sort of meta organism, not only me and my human genome and all the biomass that it produces, um, but also all these other hundreds of species that, that coexist and share my body, mostly in the colon, mostly in the, in the lower gut, uh, but also on the skin and in the mouth, any surface that's exposed to the outside world. Um, maybe using the Greek chimera myth here is a bit of an overstatement for this, this, this phenomenon, this metaphor, it maybe isn't totally appropriate. Because if you think about the biomass, you know, maybe only about a few hundred grams of our body weight is microbial. The vast majority of our, of our body weight is coming from biomass produced from our own genes encoded in our genome. Um, however, this very small amount of biomass, mostly in our gut, contains about 100 times more genetic capacity than our genomes do, right? Millions of genes in our microbiome, uh, as opposed to tens of thousands of genes in the human genome. And over evolutionary time, either through co-evolution or co-diversification or however you want to define it, uh, we have some, to some extent, outsourced some of the functionality of our physiology, of our, of our bodies, to our microorganisms. Uh, and understanding the linkage between microbes in our bodies and what happens when that linkage breaks 
is sort of the next stage in, in, in sort of personalized medicine, thinking in terms of our of this meta organism uh, idea. Now, the, the field itself, the microbiome field, is about 15 years old, thinking about um, kind of high throughput sequencing of, of, of microbial communities. And we know a ton of information for, the, say, the human microbiome about who lives where and under what conditions, like what species are here or there, under what disease condition or, or, or who are healthy or who are, who are pathogenic. That we have a pretty good handle on. We've done a lot of the groundwork, right? This is, a, this is Alexander von Humboldt's map here showing the distribution of species as you climb an elevation on this mountain. You know, we've really, we've really mapped out the space about who's where. But what's less known about the microbiome is, you know, what, is, what are they all doing? Like, what is the functionality of these complex ecologies, of these complex sets of organisms? How do, how do we predict behavior? How do we predict output and function um, from, from this ecological information that we're observing? And by and large, uh, the sort of crosstalk going on, the communication going on between our microbes and, and our bodies is, is written in a language of small molecules, small metabolites. That is how microbes speak to us, in a sense, uh, and how we speak back to them. Unfortunately, we don't have a Rosetta Stone for deciphering what they're saying. Um, we sort of have to start from scratch and try to learn that language as we go. Um, but you know, the molecules that are produced by our commensal microbiota are found in our bloodstream. They're circulating throughout our bodies. They're bathing all of our organs. Um, and they affect gene expression and, and, and functions in our bodies and, and a lot of stuff that we don't yet quite understand. And you know, similarly, the molecules that the human body is producing and feeding into our gut is having a huge impact on the function and ecology and behavior of the various organisms that live in that ecosystem. So it's this really intimate cross communication that's constantly happening. And we know that when it breaks down or when something goes wrong, um, diseases can erupt. Path pathological conditions can come out of that. Um, and despite knowing that this is occurring, we don't quite understand the etiologies of these, of these perturbations, like what exactly is driving disease. And I think to get there, we really have to decipher what, what's being said. And this requires a systems approach, right? To sort of Lee Hood's vision for, for founding this institute, um, biology is complicated and pulling things apart and studying one little piece at a time, oftentimes you miss what's going on in the, in the more holistic view of the system. And this is very much the case when thinking about interactions between the microbiota and the body. Uh, it really requires efforts to kind of interrogate many different systems of the body and integrate large amounts of information to be able to predict functional outputs. And this is a slide uh, that actually kind of shows all the different data inputs to the, um, the COVID-19 clinical trial that the Heath Lab is running here at ISP, uh, the so-called INCOV study. And you can see that, you know, this approach at ISB is to, you know, take a, it's a systems approach. It's a systems approach to science where you collect an enormous amount of data from broad swaths of, of the system. For a given sample, you're, you're looking at genetics, you're looking at, you know, uh, immune profiling, uh, clinical data, viral profiling, proteomics, metabolomics, soup to nuts, as much as you can possibly measure, you, you try to get that information so that you can build a broader holistic view of the system. Um, and what this means in terms of medicine and 21st century medicine is that, you know, it's more expensive to, to generate this kind of data, uh, give, but it gives you much deeper insights. So say if you're, if your clinical trial that you're running, you know, mostly, most of the time when they run a clinical trial, you measure like one or two things across tens of thousands of people. And then you have really, really good statistics for, for that one measurement. Um, but if, if it doesn't work, if the trial fails, you're sort of back to the to square one. You don't have enough information to know why it failed or understand what might be going on. Or maybe it only worked in a subset of the population and not in another, but like why, you don't know. Whereas if you had all of this dense phenotypic information in your trial, sure, it's a smaller trial. Sure, you're less powered to see certain things. But if it doesn't work, at least you have a starting point to understand what's going on. And so when I arrived here at ISB, this was sort of the, the paradigm that they were working in. 
Uh, but the question was, how do we integrate the microbiome into this picture of profiling all the various systems of the human body? So that's the end of my introduction to like microbiome, systems biology, and, and why I'm here. I'll start talking about science by highlighting a, a recent study that we just published um, about a month ago that was profiled in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. And this looks at um, the relationship between a pattern that we detected in the gut microbiomes of, of many different human beings and healthy aging and survival in the latest decades of human life. Um, so if you haven't seen it, this is the title of the article. Anahad O'Connor wrote it up. He's a kind of wellness um, exercise journalist who's written a few kind of microbiome articles. He did a great job. Uh, and I will say this art piece is beautiful by Niv Bavarsky. Uh, kind of really highlights this, this meta-organism idea of, of the human being in the microbiome. So healthy aging. The question that sort of set this whole study off was, you know, is the microbiome a, a sort of knob or a, or a dial that one can tune to modulate the outcome of, of aging, of different aging phenotypes? Some people age more healthily and some people age less healthily. Can we segregate the, the population and, and see differences coming from their microbiome that can explain these, these phenotypic differences in an aging cohort. Uh, the work here was, was predominantly driven by Tomasz Wolmanski, uh, who is in the labs of Nathan Price and Lee Hood, two really close and generous collaborators here at ISB, uh, working with Noah Rappaport, another uh, research scientist here at ISB, uh, and Eric Orwall, who's an aging researcher in Oregon uh, and brought in a, a large cohort of older men that we included in our analysis. Um, and in addition, oops, looks like some of the names got cut off, but uh, Christian Diener and Sushmita Petrodon are two folks out of my lab who are involved in this work. So if you read the literature on aging in the microbiome, you find a lot of divergent results, at least in the past. Um, in centenarians, it's been widely reported that the sort of core bacteria that tend to be shared among people uh, are slowly declining in relative frequency with age in these in these healthily aging folks and the subdominant taxa that, that kind of make us each more unique, unique kind of microbiome snowflakes. These organisms are rising in frequency uh, as we age uh, in, in these centenarian cohorts. Um, however, this pattern has not been observed in people in say assisted living facilities uh, in aging cohorts in Europe where people may be kind of less healthily aging. And in fact, the opposite has sort of been shown that these core taxa sort of maintain their dominance or even kind of rise a bit in dominance with, with age. So these divergent results, you know, we, we really wanted to get a handle on uh, whether or not there might be multiple signatures of aging within the microbiome. And to quickly define these concepts of core and subdominant taxa, um, if you compare any two people on planet Earth, uh, they, well, let's just say two Americans, this makes it simpler. You, you will find that about 30% of the bacterial species in their gut is shared. Um, if you compare three people, that drops to like maybe 7% of species are shared between all three of those people. And then you keep including more and more people and you get down to a very, very small subset of taxa that are widely distributed across the entire population. Um, so most of the organisms in our particular system are kind of the, this unique fingerprint that, that makes us an, individ, an individual from a microbiome standpoint. So these core taxa that make us all more similar seem to be declining in abundance. Um, I won't go into this too much. Uh, this is just the data sets that were involved in the analysis. We had these two really deeply phenotyped kind of systems approach cohorts. One is the Arabel cohort that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, sort of a, a wellness cohort of people between the ages of 18 and about 90, um, where we have deep information about you know, their blood metabolomes, their proteomes, their whole genome sequence, so Fitbit tracking, um, all this data collected on the individual person, in addition to uh, data on their microbiomes. Um, the second cohort is to drill down into an aging uh, cohort, and this is Mr. Oss, and it's a cohort that was originally recruited to study osteoporosis in men, which is an understudied phenomenon. Um, it's about a thousand older men between about 80 and 100 years old. So we define sort of a new, somewhat new concept here uh, in this analysis when, when digging into the data, which is what we're calling uniqueness. So, uh, you know, the reason we went to 
this uniqueness measure is that it's difficult to define a core microbiome globally. If I was to go to India and ask what is the core, uh, what are the core species in that population, they would be different than the core species that you would find in Europe, for example. Right, like Bacteroides and Prepatella are these two genera that tend to, one tends to occur in, in developing world or in indigenous cultures, and the other is, is, is in more developed countries. So this shift and turnover in what, what is core across the planet, we thought maybe it would be more consistent if we can define uh, sort of the inverse of core. Uh, and we came up with this idea of uniqueness. How unique is my microbiome when I compare myself to everyone else in the population? Um, and visually, that's what this little cartoon is showing here. So each say each one of these dots is an individual person and distances between the dots is sort of how, you know, dissimilar their ecologies are from one another. So people who are on the fringes of this cloud who have the longest distance to their nearest neighbor, they have a higher uniqueness score than someone who's more central to the cloud that has a shorter nearest neighbor distance. So that's, that's the actual metric that we're calculating. And what we find is when we look at people across all the decades of life in both our sort of test and validation cohorts here, uh, we see a, a gradual increase or drift in increasing uniqueness with age. Uh, it begins at around 40 or 50 years old, which is interesting because that's also around the time in life when immune signatures of aging start to begin. Uh, and it accelerates uh, in late, in, into the later decades of life. Um, so this was, this was true in the Arabel data set across different vendors. Um, we also validated this observation in another large cohort called the American Gut data set. So it seems no matter where you look, this, this pattern ar arises in different populations. Interestingly, this, this sort of drift apart phenomenon in the ecology of, of the gut microbiome was associated with a convergence in the metabolome. So this uniqueness score was correlated with or associated with various blood metabolites. Uh, and, and the significant hits here are shown here on the left. Um, and th these were really interesting to look at. The, the top two, the ones that were most significant, and in particular, phenylacetoglutamine, if you look it up, it's actually patented as a biomarker for healthy aging. There are a few studies showing that in centenarian populations, this particular blood metabolite is, is very much elevated in, in, those, in those individuals. But not only is it elevated in centenarians, it's higher in the children of centenarians. So people who haven't yet achieved longevity, but they are likely to achieve based on their genetics and their environment and so on. So it, potentially a predictor of healthy aging. And P-creosol is similar. Um, we, we see them at higher abundance in centenarians. And con, you know, strangely, these are actually partially toxic uh, compounds. They, they can be toxicants to, to various organs like the, the kidneys or the liver in high enough concentrations, but they also seem to be associated with health here in this aging uh, cohort. Um, more interestingly, perhaps, because they had been less talked about in human cohorts are indoles in the context of aging. So we saw indoles coming up as being associated with this uniqueness drift or this decline in core taxa. And indoles have been shown in animal models to um, directly causally increase lifespan. So in a mouse model, if you feed them indole, uh, the mice will live a longer life and they'll, they'll have a longer health span as well. So they'll be less frail and they'll live for longer. Um, in addition to that, there was some Bile acids, actually one of the secondary bile acids we found was, has been shown to extend the lifespan of fruit flies. <laughs> a little bit of a further away taxonomic hit, but um, it, was, it was nice to see that some of these associations have actually been shown in animal models, non-human animal models to, to be directly causally linked to, to healthy aging and longevity. Um, and just as some background here, indoles are, are fermentation byproducts of tryptophan that are produced by our microbes. So all of these, these red guys over here are, are essentially derived from protein um, and they're microbial derivatives. So they're small molecules produced by our gut microbes through fermentation of amino acids. Okay, so we wanted to kind of validate that indeed our, our uniqueness pattern is kind of the inverse of a decline in core taxa. So in this particular cohort, these are Americans, and the main core genus in, in this population is Bacteroides, this genus Bacteroides. 
we saw a very strong negative correlation between uniqueness and, and bacteroides. As this core taxon declined in abundance, the uniqueness of your microbiome increased, sort of what we would expect. And when we, we looked at this correlation between age and uniqueness in the Mr. Oss cohort, it was actually um, weaker than we had seen in the Aravel data set, which was kind of strange. We were kind of, we were scratching our heads. Um, but then we thought, okay, well, maybe this is part of this sort of ambigu ambiguity in the literature for what has been reported previously. Some studies do show this core taxon thing, and some studies don't, uh, and, it's, and so it's very divergent. Maybe it's related to health. Uh, so Tomas was able to kind of stratify the population by four different metrics of healthy aging. Um, so this is what we have here in this plot. Uh, the top one here is walking speed. So the faster you walk, the, the less frail you are or the healthier you are as, a, as an older person. This is a well-validated metric. There was self-reported health. So I think it could be excellent, good, fair, or poor. We just had everybody who said they were excellent and then everybody else as two different groups. Uh, medication usage was another. So taking few medications versus taking many medications is somewhat of a proxy for health. And then there's this thing called the life space score. And this is just a score for how modal, mobile you are in your life. Um, how often do you get out of the bed, out of your bedroom, out of your apartment, out of your neighborhood? So it's a, sc a score about that, about how much you get around. And then a composite score was simply, you had to be healthy according to three of these metrics to be composite healthy. And across the board, the healthy folks showed a nice correlation between uniqueness and aging. Um, and the less healthy folks, the correlation was completely undetectable. It wasn't there. Uh, there was no correlation. So it did, did seem to be the case that there are indeed kind of two different signatures of aging in relation to the gut microbiome. A healthy one associated with this continued development and drift, and a less healthy one that's associated with kind of a static maintenance of what your microbiome was when you were younger. If you look at this abundance of this core tax on bacteroides across this older cohort, um, this is now splitting folks into age tertiles for the healthy people and for the less healthy people. Um, so the T3 here is the oldest of this older population, right? And the oldest third of this older population. And T1 is the youngest third of this older population. Um, and if you look at bacteria's abundance, there's this nice decline as, as people are older and older and older. And this is totally absent from the folks that are showing, you know, less healthy pattern. Now, the kicker of this analysis is that we had um, survival data. We had follow-up data on patients, multiple clinical visits. And so there was a four-year window between clinical visits where you know, we had the baseline information on what was the composition of their microbiome. And then we had future data on whether or not they, they lived or died in that, in that window. And for these folks who are, say, 85 plus, um, you know, the chance of, of death is, is, is not uh, small in that, in that sort of a time window. So when analyzing that data, we found that if you took the folks that had the highest amount of bacteroides abundance at that zero time point, that first clinical visit, and you looked into the future uh, about you know, who, who lived and who died, um, and, and the, the folks who had the lowest amount of bacteroides, this core taxon, you found that, that the, the folks that maintained a higher abundance of this core microbe were, were more likely to die um, at follow-up. Um, there's a, this is a significant difference between the, the areas within between these two lines here. Um, and if you build another kind of more sophisticated model, Cox proportional hazards regression model, where you can control for various covariates, and you look at just say folks that are 85 plus who they've already achieved old age, but they're close to achieving extreme longevity. Um, if you look at that population and you control for many different variables, so for example, we controlled for you know, cardiovascular disease, uh, body mass index, a few other factors that could be associated with mortality. We, we control for those in the model to just isolate the effect of this uniqueness pattern or bacteroides abundance, we looked at both. And, and however you looked at it, uniqueness or, or bacteroides, um, you, if you had a, a more unique microbiome, you're less likely to die. So this, this coefficient here is, is under one. And if you had more bacteroides, you were uh, more likely to die. The coefficient is, is higher than one. And, and the 1.9 here is actually saying that I think for every, every standard deviation in bacteroides abundance, you were above it from the general population. 
you were almost twice as likely to die at follow-up in this group of 85 plus year olds. So it was a fairly significant effect. So anyway, I, I, you know, because this big splashy New York Times story came out, I thought I would tell you all this, this interesting um, uh, story on, on this particular topic. Uh, I got, haven't gotten to diet yet, so I'm going to quickly plug that here, and then and I promise I'll get into to something more about diet in the next little little part of my presentation. Um, so, what are the dietary implications of, of what we I just talked about? Well, one one are indoles. So, you know, if this signature of increasing indoles in in, in the blood associated with this uniqueness pattern is is potentially contributing to this healthy age phenotype. Um, there are certain kinds of foods that are that are more rich in these types of compounds. So, for example, cruciferous vegetables like your broccolis and your cabbages and so on. Um, eating more of these is is you know not bad for you anyway, uh, but but may actually contribute positively to this type of metabolic um, pattern that we're seeing in the microbiome. But generally speaking, you know, the, people often ask, "What should I eat for my microbiome?" Uh, and there's really no good answer to that to that question, except uh, you should just eat a lot more fiber. You should eat a lot more fruits and veggies um, and have a diverse diet that covers a lot of stuff. Uh, that's probably the best advice you can get. Try to prepare your own meals. Try not to eat as much processed foods with a lot of sugar and sodium in them and, and less meat and more plant material. Um, the kind of the Mediterranean diet has been universally shown to be just pretty good for you in general. Um, but when it comes to like specific personalized advice, there's a lot of companies claiming that they can give you this type of nutrigenomic or microbiome based personalized advice. And much of that is sort of snake oil at this point. Uh, much of it is sort of overhyping our predictive ability that the science isn't quite there yet. Um, but, you know, you can still say eating more fiber is generally good. Most of us in the Western world don't eat enough fiber. Even those of us who think we eat a lot of fiber, we're probably not eating enough fiber. So anyway, next time you're, you're sitting down to a meal and feeding yourself, think about feeding your microbes in addition to feeding your own body. So that being said, saying that, you know, it's sort of sci-fi to say that you can give personalized specific advice about diet. Now I'm gonna tell you about ways of giving personalized specific advice about diet. Uh, but, this, but again, this is sort of, this isn't ready for prime time. You're, you're getting a peek into the future potentially of, of what might be possible in may, maybe half a decade or a decade down the road once more science has been done. Um, so, you know, basically what this section is about is um, a technique in systems biology uh, called metabolic modeling, um, where you're taking known information. There's, there's a century of research that's gone into figuring out you know, what enzymes break down what substrates and what is the sort of kinetics of those reactions and under what conditions do those reactions occur. And we have really detailed information for, for a lot of organisms about their metabolic networks. So for E. coli, for example, we pretty much understand a lot, a lot about their metabolic network. We can kind of reconstruct in the computer what their metabolic network is and make predictions and then test them in the real world and they hold up pretty well. Um, so this metabolic modeling framework works great in biotechnology for a subset of organisms that we've studied really, really deeply. And this sort of big hairball here is, is, a, is a metabolic network of an entire microbiome, uh, which, I'll, which I'll get into now. And each one of these little, little compartments is an individual bacterium. And you can see the density of, of, of uh, edges here are sort of the internal metabolic fluxes happening inside that cell. And the divisions between these little, little areas are kind of different taxa and, and uh, exchanges that are occurring across cells. You get you have more exchanges within than across, and you get some like really kind of central processes like say bile acid metabolism or what have you, where a lot of things are contributing to it outside of the cell. And we're now just beginning to be able to build these types of whole community models. And along that line, we recently published a paper uh, last year, in fact. Um, so Christian Diener, an incredibly talented systems biologist and research scientist in my group, along with our collaborator in Mexico City, Dr. Osvaldo Resendez Antonio, um, we, we've constructed uh, what we're calling a metagenome scale metabolic model. It's a sort of metabolic reconstruction of all the genomes of all the bacteria that can live in your gut, right? Um, and in addition to that, 
uh, we can sort of layer data on top of the model. So we can personalize one of these metabolic models to an individual human um, by setting the abundances of the various taxa and the presences and absences of what species are present in their system by sequencing their microbiome and, and using that to sort of inform the, the initial conditions of the model, to constrain the model to look like their gut. In addition to constraining the microbiome, we can also constrain the diet. So you can personalize the dietary input. Uh, and there are several sort of standard ones that we can use, like a standard Western diet or a Mediterranean diet. Um, but with a little bit of elbow grease, you can actually build uh, diets that are specific to an individual person if you know enough about what they're eating. So it allows us to sort of initialize this model of, of an individual person's gut, and you can feed things in and you can look at what comes out. Um, you can predict metabolic outputs of a given person's microbiome um, from a given input. You can see who's cross-feeding who, what bugs are feeding each other, you know, who, you know what, 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 sort of what would an intervention do to the system, uh, what's being output that, that's available to the human host. Um, all this stuff can kind of be played with and tinkered with uh, inside a model like this, something that would be kind of difficult to do in an experiment, for example. And you get all kinds of fun stuff from these models. And I won't uh, bore you all with, with the nerdy stuff, uh, but I'll give you a couple of uh, tastes of, of, of the kind of things we can do. So on the left here, this is an example of asking a question, what is your microbiome eating? So here in this heat map, every column is a, is a human being, a different person, an individual, a metagenome that we've initialized. And we fed every one of these people the same exact diet in silico, so to speak. We've, all, we've given them all the standard Western diet. And now we can, we can ask, you know, what, what metabolites from that diet are being sucked up by their microbiome? What is their microbiome eating from that diet? Um, and this is sort of what we see in this heat map. So the rows here are all different metabolites. And we see kind of cool clusters here where there's some people's microbiomes that are, that are better at consuming fibers uh, and other people's microbiomes that, that seem to specialize more on branch chain amino acids. Um, and and it, they don't really overlap that much. Uh, and so we're still trying to kind of play with this and understand it a bit. You can do these cool knockout experiments. So this is all data here, this, this, this web is all data from one person's model. And you can, you can build up an interaction network between all the species in their gut microbiome by essentially taking the model and pulling out one of the species, just deleting it from the model and rerunning it to steady state and asking, what does that do to the growth rates of all the other species in the system? If I take this guy out, these other species can grow faster. Some of these other species can grow slower. And by doing this, you can kind of see what is the competitive or cooperative interactions going on within the system. So for example, if you, if you delete the genus Bacteroides, a lot of these red edges come off, which is to say that there's a lot of competitive interactions. If you get rid of Bacteroides, a lot of other stuff can grow more quickly in the system. And the opposite is true for Acromancia, which is down here. Um, this is a known mucus degrader. And it seems to chew up mucus and, and liberate a bunch of metabolites that other taxa can consume. And so if you delete acromancia from the system, the growth rates of many other organisms actually declines. Um, so sort of, you know, lots of cool little experiments you can do with the model that would be very difficult to do in vivo. But more importantly to our purposes here for, for dietary interventions and designing personalized diets is that you can do in silico dietary interventions. So what this plot is showing, this is a very busy plot, so don't expect anybody to look at the whole thing. Um, but the rows here are individual, or sorry, the columns are individual interventions. So orange are dietary interventions. So we're turning up the abundance of a given dietary metabolite. The blues are probiotic intervention. So I can increase the abundance of a given microbe. And what all the rows here now are, are the production of short chain fatty acids. So these are very common molecules produced by our microbiomes. They were generally thought to be good for you. Um, so acetate, butyrate, and propionate are, are the three that we're looking at here for three different people. So the, 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 that's how it's kind of going. So it's two people with diabetes in the top two rows here. And then the third row is a healthy control for acetate production. And then you, you sort of repeat the ordering for butyrate and for propionate. And I'll direct your, your attention to one part of the plot here where there's a number of dietary interventions that 
uh, increase butyrate production. Butyrate is this really kind of thought to be healthful metabolite that reduces inflammation. It's an energy source for our, for our gut epithelial cells. You can turn up butyrate pretty easy with, with a number of these dietary interventions in the healthy person, but the same exact dietary interventions have no effect on butyrate production in the diabetics, which is to say that you feed three people the same exact thing, a banana or whatever, and their metabolic outputs are completely different. So this is sort of an argument for why, you know, future personalized dietary interventions might actually be very useful because it does indeed seem to be the case that people have very different um, outputs for the same input. So that's all modeling, but so, and how do we, how do we validate it? Um, and I apologize for showing you a picture of, of poop soup, but we are doing what are called poop soup experiments or ex vivo uh, stool culturing, where you can take someone's turd, right? You can sequence it and you can use those sequences to, to build a MICOM model, but you can also take that same turd and turn it into a soup, a homogenate that you put into 96 well plates, like a bunch of different replicates. And you can add individual dietary components to that soup and incubate it for short periods of time and measure what the metabolic outputs are. So let's say I said a banana earlier, the main fiber in a banana is inulin. And so for our first little experiment, we, we actually used inulin as the example. We recruited two individuals. So this is work with a, with a great collaborator, Fred Hutch, uh, Dr. Joanna Lambie, um, and a grad student in the lab, Nick Bowman, is, is driving a lot of this work along with uh, Christian Diener and Sushmita Patpardhan, who, who did these actual experiments. So we recruited two different people. You can see that they had different microbiomes. Essentially, you know, donor A had more Bacteroidetes, the, the phylum Bacteroidetes, then donor B. Um, we wanted to keep the incubation window for, for how long we're kind of cooking these poop soups um, short because we didn't want the community composition over this incubation time to change all that much from what it was when it was still inside the person. And so that's sort of what we're showing here is that over our incubation window, the, the microbiome didn't really change all that much. Um, and we did targeted metabolomics to measure these short chain fatty acids being produced by these two different people's poop soups. Uh, we had triplicate replicates for each of these experiments. And what we see is that for donor A and B, there really wasn't any difference in the acetate production, but for butyrate and propionate, uh, donor B made more of both of these short chain fatty acids for the same exact amount of inulin put into the system. So you even experimentally, you give two people the same exact dietary component, they make totally different things if their microbiomes are different. Now, the big question is, can MyCom, if we, you know, if we could took, take that sequence of the, of the turd from before and start um, and initialize the MyCom model and, and do the same sort of inulin input in the model, does the prediction of the model match the experiment? And at least for this two-person cohort, it's still very preliminary. Uh, the answer is yes. So we, both MyCom and the experiment show that donor B produces more propionate and more butyrate, uh, and there really wasn't much of a difference for acetate. So at least for these short-chain fatty acids in this very small pilot experiment, we seem to be able to make personalized predictions for a given dietary input. And you know, the pandemic has made it difficult to do more of these experiments in the past year, and also they're kind of expensive to do. So we're kind of waiting on some grants to come in. But you know, I, this is a very useful uh, experimental system with, with modeling and paired experiments to really do proof of concept to show that we are capable of making quantitative predictions about dietary outputs for a given dietary input. And you know, just sort of a, a broad overview as I end off here on uh, you know, how, how we're thinking about the future of, of you know, linking microbiome function to human health you know, we're, we're doing this sort of systems approach in these large cohorts where we integrate data from the human, metabolomics, genomes, uh, proteomes, and so on, with variation in the ecology to see what amount of the ecological variance is resonant with shifts in the in phenotype of the host. So that's one component of, of the work. Another component of the work is building these mechanistic models, these metabolic models that allow us to make predictions and simulate someone's microbiome in, in, in the computer. Uh, and then, you know, validating those simulations with these poop soup experiments and hopefully in the future, 
uh, actually doing feeding studies where we can kind of prove that a personalized diet actually is, is better at increasing, for example, butyrate production than some sort of standard of care diet. Um, so that's sort of what we're thinking for, for the future. Um, I'll end off with this beautiful, uh, beautiful picture that Niv gave us of, of, of an aging microbiome. Um, and I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Sean. And congratulations again on the New York Times article. That's really exciting. Oh. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you missed it too. Um, that article is posted on ISB's website and it's under our news tab. So you can check it out there. Um, Sean, our guests have some questions for you. So the first one is, can a fiber diet over many years override genetics? Hmm. Well, I'm not quite sure uh, what, what is meant by that. Um, there's a lot of things that genetics can influence and there's a lot of things that fiber can influence. Um, you know, for example, uh, inflammatory bowel disease has a genetic component. There, there are risk factors genetically for, for having IBD, although not everybody with genetic risk manifests disease. And I would guess that this can be manipulated or biased through, through behavior and lifestyle. So if you're eating a healthier diet, um, you're, you're sort of playing the odds in your favor as opposed to for what your genetic risk might be for, for certain diseases. So the healthier you can live, the more you exercise, the more you eat well, um, the better off you'll be, but that's pretty common sense. Okay, fair enough. Um, now, now we have another question about um, the relationship between antibiotics and the gut microbiome. Can you talk a little bit about that? What, like, what is the relationship? Yeah, like what, what do anti, when, when I take antibiotics, what does that do to my gut microbiome? It, it affects it, yeah. So, you know, antibiotics, there, there's no such thing as a completely targeted, well, I shouldn't say that. Most antibiotics are, are fairly broad. They will affect a large swaths of, of bacteria and not just the pathogen that you're trying to attack, right? So maybe you have strep throat or something, you're taking antibiotic to kill that, that one bug, but it's going to have collateral damage, collateral effects, uh, knocking down the abundance and, and killing off or, or, or what have you, a number of your own commensal microbes. Um, and it's been shown that um, broad spectrum antibiotics deplete the diversity of the microbiome. Um, you go through these bottlenecks. Um, oftentimes people will recover. They'll, they'll bounce right back from one of these perturbations, but sometimes they don't. Some, and we don't quite know how to predict when someone will bounce back and when they won't. But we do know that like really chronic usage of antibiotics, many, many rounds of antibiotics and using them a lot when you're really young um, can have a pretty detrimental impact on, on your ability to recover. Oh, so, so if you go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes antibiotics. Hey, antibiotics have saved, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of lives. Right? Okay, They're sure. incredibly amazing uh, tools for medicine. So if, if the doc tells you to take antibiotics, take antibiotics. Yeah. But um, they are definitely overprescribed. If you have a cold, please don't demand that you get antibiotics from your doctor. That will, won't make a difference. We probably should be using fewer antibiotics. And one of the biggest places where you know we're, we're having trouble with the rise of antimicrobial resistance is is in our. I, I would say maybe even less about how much we're using antibiotics as humans in medicine, and maybe even more about how antibiotics are being used in the environment, say in agriculture. Um, a lot of these resistance genes are, are kind of bouncing from you know agricultural soils into the human gut. And so these, these sort of farms where lots of antibiotics are used are these breeding grounds for some of these antimicrobial resistance genes that have existed in some bug living in the soil for millions of years and are suddenly being enriched by, by this human activity. Um, so, so we use too many antibiotics across the board, not just in medicine, um, and that's causing issues for, for human health. But right. yeah, it's true that like, if you can help it, try to take fewer antibiotics, but if, if you were prescribed them, take them. Okay. Sounds good. Um, this is a question about um, probiotic supplements. Are they snake oil or are they beneficial or not? Um, or does it matter which probiotic for which person? It's a hard question. You know, I really have a lot of hope for probiotics. Uh, I think, I think the future is really bright for probiotics, 
But if you look historically at, at the probiotic market, it's a it's an incredibly unregulated market. So I remember when in my one of my PhD advisors, Jack Gilbert, uh, went to Whole Foods and, and bought a bunch of different probiotics and then went and sequenced them in the lab. And only about half of them were the same species that was on the label. So it's just like the, the quality control on many of them is, is very low and there's not a lot of oversight. Um, so whether or not you're getting a, a consistent organism when you, when you say you're getting, you know, bifidobacterium longum or something, is it really that organism that you're getting in, in your probiotic? That's one question. So maybe you should splurge on slightly more expensive probiotics that, that, that have, that, that are, that are pretty be better regulated or, or better manufactured. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's another problem, which is you know, the probiotics that we currently have are what are considered generally regarded as safe by the FDA or grass. Uh, and these organisms, the reason they're considered safe is that they're already in food. They're the, the same microbes that you use to make yogurt or pickles or cheese or whatever. Um, and they're not usually actually the organisms that are abundant in the gut microbiome. You know, I would really love to give somebody like a Fecalibacterium prasnitzii probiotic. Right. This is one of the like very abundant butyrate producing good bugs that live, live in people's guts, but it would be illegal for me to do that because um, no one has done like a phase one clinical trial to show that f -pro is safe, even though 90% of us are carrying f -pro around in our guts right now, right? So there's, there are these regulatory hurdles for how do, you, how do you make useful probiotics that are actually abundant in the gut system uh, that don't cost a gazillion dollars because once you've taken something through clinical trials, the cost's going to shoot way up because it you know costs tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to run things through these trials, and then the drug companies that do it expect to make a profit. And so it's you know you're, if you're used to spending ten bucks for a probiotic at the supermarket, that's going to be very different uh, for something that's gone through something like that. Um, so it's it's tough, right? And even the ones that exist, some of them have been shown to have. Um, beneficial effects under certain conditions, but it seems very context dependent. Um, you know, like with diet, if I give two people the same probiotic, it's going to have different effects on them, probably, uh, because the context of their microbiome, the context of their physiology and their genome and what have you is all different. Um, so we just need to get better at, at predicting uh, what will happen if we put a probi probiotic in the system on a personalized level. And we need to get better at actually, you know, coming up with a, a list of organisms that we can give as probiotics that are actually the, the abundant, effective, healthful organisms that, that normally live in the gut. And we don't yet have that list available to us to give to people. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, this question about the, what is the effect of hydration or lack of it on the microbiome? Huh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. The, the inside of the body is pretty homeostatically controlled. So I'm guessing that the gut microbiome is not going to notice much of a difference um, for minor differences in hydration. If you're super dehydrated, you know, your whole body starts to, to have problems. So I'm guessing that'll, that'll, that'll be an issue. Um, it's a good question. I, I don't think I've seen a study on hydration and the composition of the microbiome. Um, right. Yeah, not sure. Um, so there's a question you mentioned um, back to Roides earlier and that um, it's not so great. So, so the question is if you, want, if you want to reduce that and work on getting a healthier makeup that will lead to your more unique microbiome, how do you do that? Mm. I'm glad this came up because I, I don't want people to come away thinking that bacteroides is not, is not so great. Right? Okay. Like, Many bacteroides, many species within bacteroides are considered very good. They're, they're good bugs. Um, they're, they're essentially good for you. And, and you know, having abundant high levels of bacteroides seems to be totally normal and totally healthy when you're in your 20s and 30s. Uh, we're seeing a signature of, of a steady decline in this genus when you get really, really old. Um, and this could be for a number of reasons. So for example, a lot of the organisms in the gut the, a lot of these bacteroides species um, can sort of switch between eating mucus and eating dietary fiber. So they can, they can munch on your mucus layer. And, you know, if you're producing a lot of mucus, young people have very healthy, robust mucus production. 
but mucus production sort of steadily declines as we get older. When we're very old, we're, we're just making less mucus in our guts. And so the mucus layer is like this barrier that, that, it, that it's like, it's like, a, it's like a detente between our commensal microbes and our immune system. Um, and if it goes away, suddenly we get all this inflammation and all of this sort of pathology because our microbes are getting too close to the tissue. Um, so part of it could be that having too many bacteroides around when you're 80, uh, you know, the sort of equilibrium between consumption and production of the mucus is sort of off. And so you're, you're getting too thin there. So, you know, an, an interesting um, conclusion from this, this aging microbiome paper is that you don't necessarily want to turn back the clock for a healthful aging microbiome, right? You don't want to have a 20 year old microbiome. 20 year old microbiome might be terrible for you when you're, when you're 80. When you're 80, you might want an 80 year old microbiome, right? You want the, the appropriate microbiome. And, and interestingly, you know, since this paper's come out, I've seen a few papers in mice where they've done fecal transplants from like old mice to young mice and vice versa. And um, they found that uh, actually fecal transplants from older mice into germ-free mice um, show a more healthful outcome than fecal transplants from younger mice to germ-free mice. Um, you get more butyrate production, less inflammation from the older mice. Um, and then another recent one showing that if you put a young fecal transplant into an old mouse, that doesn't seem so good either. So, you know, this sort of idea that uh, a 20 year old microbiome that's healthy for a 20 year old maybe isn't healthy for an 80 year old seems to be, um, to be holding up in, in other experiments. Okay, great. Um, if I want, let's say maybe I ha haven't been eating as much fiber as I should have been. And after listening to this and I, I want to make some changes, I'm going to go to my refrigerator, my pantry right now and clean it out and, um, add some <coughs> broccoli and cruciferous vegetables. How long would it actually change, uh, take to make that change in my gut microbiome? How long would I have to do that to really, you know, make a difference? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> some of the work I did in my postdoc was kind of time series analysis of the microbiome and day to day, it fluctuates a fair amount, but like on a week to month time scale, it, it's pretty stable. You know, if you, if you knock it, it kind of returns back to a steady state. Mm -hmm. And even if you do sort of day to day shifts in your diet, it, it, it's hard to budget. It's, it's sort of set as it is and, and you can knock it around a bit, but it, it likes to kind of stay where it's at seemingly. Um, but it's been shown that really persistent long-term changes in diet and lifestyle can budget and then move it to a new direction. There was a really cool study from uh, Dan Knight's lab uh, looking at immigrants from Thailand where they showed that um, depending on how much time you, time you spent in the U.S., your microbiome started to look more and more and more American. Um, and so that just long-term dietary change can indeed push you to a new state, but it'll probably take you a few months to get there. So you, you really need to change your habits for the long term to, to get it to reflect. Okay. okay. Um, so this is a question about um, getting tested, getting your gut microbiome tested. Can you do that? And you know, what does that look like? Yeah, um, there are companies that will do it. Uh, you know, one of the big ones, I don't know if people saw the news, but uh, there, was, there was one called Ubiome a few years ago, and they, they just got uh, a bunch of indictments handed down from the FEC for fraud. <laughs> they, uh, it had nothing to do with the, the microbiome data stuff. They, they were essentially double billing health insurance, which, you know, why were they being able to bill health insurance in the first place is a good question. Um, but they, they did some sort of, that, that, that used to be the place you would, you would give people to go and get their microbiome sequenced, but they no longer exist. Um, there's, a, there's a group at UCSD called the American Gut Project. I believe you can still get your microbiome sequence through them. I think they maybe have migrated it to a new name, the Microseta Initiative. Um, so you could look those up. That's sort of an academic platform, but allows for sort of consumer, I think you have to pay 99 bucks and you can get your microbiome sequenced. And then there are these other consumer companies that are more focused on this idea of scientific wellness and making predictions for you. Um, so, you know, one is like, is biome is, is one that, that's around, um, you know, I, and another one that, that a colleague of mine now works at is, is called Longevity Health. Uh, and these companies will, will get a sample from you and they will sequence it. And then they will give you some amount of like personalized advice about what you can do. Um, I would take a lot of that personalized advice with a big grain of salt. I, I, I don't really think 
they know how to make that advice yet. So, uh, but if you just want to have your microbiome sequenced and see who's there and you're willing to pay whatever price they're charging, great. Okay, super. Uh, last question. Uh, you talked about how nutrition can impact the microbiome um, in a positive way. If you're, you know, change change it up there. Are there other factors? And you quickly mentioned exercise too. What what else can we do to help our gut microbiome um, outside of the diet? Well, honestly, we don't know very well. Um, you know, we you know things that damage our microbiomes. So mm -hmm. if you take antibiotics or chemotherapy or various, um, you know, low, low fiber diets, these, these, these we know are bad and, and they will kind of degrade the diversity and the functionality of the microbiome, which can have downstream disease implications, right? So low diversity can make you more susceptible to things like a C. diff infection or, you know, low diversity makes you probably op more open to inf inflammation. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, at very, we're in very early days about making very targeted lifestyle um, suggestions that are going to have maybe even like a personalized effect on an individual. What we can do is say like, there are certain things that work well across the population. It's like aspirin. You give people an aspirin and most of them, their headache's going to get less, less bad, right? It's, it's, you know, it's, well, a lot of drugs are designed in that way. Maybe they don't have a, the exact uniform effect across the whole population, but by and large, they have, they have an effect. Uh, and what we can say there from the microbiome standpoint is high fiber diets, like a Mediterranean diet, maybe eating less red meat, maybe a little more fish, uh, having nuts, more kind of plant-based oils, uh, less processed food, kind of try to cook your own food, um, eat less processed sugar, less sodium, all pretty common sense stuff that is pretty helpful across the broad population. And to complement all of that, the single best thing you can do for your long-term wellness of any sort of intervention is just exercise. Okay. You know, people don't like to hear that, but uh, exercise, if you exercise, you, you know, your long-term risk for any number of diseases goes down. Um, and indeed, it has also been shown to have an impact on your microbiome um, for, the, for the better, although that's still kind of tenuous. Okay. Super. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for today. Thank you. Yeah, good. And I'd also like to thank um, our fabulous foundation board member, Barb Moe, for being here today and thank all of you for joining us as well. We'd love to have you at another one of these events and we have one coming right up. It's on Tuesday, April 20th at 4 p.m. And you can join ISB co-founder Lee Hood for a discussion on a new approach to Alzheimer's disease. So if you're on our email list, you'll get more information about that. And you can also go directly to our website and register under our events tab. But that's all we have for you now. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening.